All right. Tonight, we are continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. And we pick up tonight in chapter 4. And uh, officially, we're going to start in verse 14. So a little background. We've been studying, just to refresh your memory, we've been studying about the rest that God has for his people. Entering into that rest through Jesus Christ, we've already we've already entered that rest, and the, you know the initial process of that, and receiving grace to be saved, and to experience the blessings of God, you know, rest from the results and consequences of sin, and you know all that is involved in the definition of the word rest, you know, a peace and tranquility and calmness and blessing and prosperity and all those all those things and of course the completion of that will come later when we you know enter that final phase of entering his rest when we're with the lord forever and forever and forever and then the warning you know comes to not be like the children of israel in the wilderness and be rebellious through unbelief and we discussed that of course in great detail the danger of backsliding, of coming into unbelief, not intentionally, but just by not giving the proper priority to doing the things that we need to to remain in fellowship with God. It can happen to any anyone, right? So, and we're just, and all through the last chapter, you know, more than once, and, you know, the warning comes, you know, just be really careful that you don't fall into unbelief, which is so easy to do. And you don't have to commit overt sin for that to be true. I mean, that certainly would do it. But just when we fail to believe God, to trust God for what he's promised us is a form of unbelief. And, you know, in the end can become rebellion against God because unbelief leads to rebellion against God. Not, you know, lack of obedience to God and what God says and what God's word demands and so forth. And then it goes into the fact, you know, that God knows everything. You know, his word is able to, the word of God is sufficient in how complete it is that there's nothing that is not covered in the word of God. Everything is revealed in God's word as far as sin and rebellion and and all that is it, covered in God's word. And then it goes on and says that the of God himself, verse 13, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God knows it all. I mean, God knows everything. So we can't fool God. And so, again, you know, he's talking to believers, be careful that you don't fall into unbelief. We've talked about that. So we have to maintain an ongoing relationship with God. And then we don't, there's no problem. If we continually are in fellowship with God, if we're praying every day and reading God's word, and submitting to God's will continually, then we won't. You know, we're not going to backslide. It's when we stop doing those things, when people stop doing that, when they skip, you know, reading God's word and other things consume them, when they're, not, when they're not praying or, you know, they stop going to church and all this links together, you can fall into that trap very easily. That can be from temptation, certainly, of sin, but also can be because of circumstances in your life. You can be overwhelmed with with problems in your life to where a person's focus is on that and you get overwhelmed, you get discouraged. And sometimes people will pull back because of that. They're discouraged and depressed and stop believing. And then they stop praying and they stop reading the Bible and they stop coming to church and, you know, without really taking any action, they can just slide into, into that, which then leads to, doing things that are wrong eventually because either our new nature or our old nature is going to control us, one or the other. And so there's all that to deal with. So 
I mean, the, the, the message here that is stressed is just keep your guard up. Maintain your relationship with the Lord continually, no matter how long you've been serving the Lord. And, uh, and everything will be fine. We have to give an account to God in all things. But then he transitions to verse 14, which is wonderful. So first he presents the possibility of rebellion, of sin, of falling out of favor with God, which is a negative. You know, that's a negative thing. That's negative. And then he turns to what is positive eventually, and he begins by making this, this statement, which might seem you know grammatically to be backwards, but it's really not if you think about it. So he makes this negative statement, which is really positive. It's formulated as a negative, but it's really positive. He says, seeing then, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, who is in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let's break that down. First of all, he's saying, you know, here's hope for us. Here's what we can really take encouragement from and renew our faith this way because, you know, there is that possibility of unbelief, of rebellion, of falling out and away from God. But here's the good news, you know. We need to realize this. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, who has gone on into, who has ascended from the earth up through the heavens into, you know, the realm where God dwells. Jesus, who is our Savior, and that's what it means, literally means the Lord our salvation or Savior for short, Jesus, the Son of God. Since that's true, since he has passed through the heaven, now, you know, and Previously, it said he's at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Let us hold fast our confession, our confession of faith in him. You know, hang tightly on to what you believe and what you've confessed, because we do have a great high priest. Now, this is also mentioned in the first part of the study of, of Hebrews um, as well. which references him as our great high priest. And I have, let me show you the scripture for that. Put that on the screen. Hebrews 2 that we studied, verse 17 previously, Therefore, in all things, Jesus, of course, he had to be made like his brethren, like us. In other words, became flesh and blood, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make perpetuation for the sins of the people to offer himself as a sacrifice that would take care of the problem, would satisfy God's demand, you know, for for that, uh, for the penalty, for, for sin, for our atonement. So there is, he's referenced as our great high priest. Okay. Um, so let's talk about then the idea of a high priest. In the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, God established the priesthood. And the priesthood, those that were called to be priests, would that was designed for them to intercede for the people. They were to be between the people and God. He would pray for them 
And they would also offer sacrifices for them because under the old covenant, you know, the blood sacrifices were established and they had to offer those continually, blood sacrifices. And then, of course, other kinds of sacrifices to grain sacrifices and meat sacrifices and, you know, various one drink offerings and so forth and so on continually. And they would do this as intercessors for the people. And God established that, the priesthood. And the priests were to come from the tribe of Levi. Of the 12 tribes, Levi was the designated tribe for the priesthood. <laughs> now, among the priests, there were there were designated the, the chief of the priests. That was the high priest or the highest order of priests priesthood the high priest it was one at a time but the high priest would be above all the other priests the chief among the priests and they they specifically were to come not only from the tribe of levi but also they would have to be a descendant of aaron of moses brother aaron to be a high priest and the high priest his responsibility went beyond just the regular priests and their duties and so forth. And the other priests could offer the sacrifices and so forth on behalf of the people. But there was a special sacrifice for the people on the once a year on the Day of Atonement. And only the high priest could offer that blood sacrifice. And he would take the blood of a bullock and, and would go into the innermost sanctum, into what was called the holiest of all, or the holiest, or the holy of holies. Holy of holies or holiest of all, both in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. And it was just a, you know, a small area that was specially designated, special place that curtained off that only he could enter and it contained the ark of the covenant and on the ark of the covenant of course was you know the altar that was on top of that and he would enter with the blood first of all for he himself and his own family and then he would also then he then after that he would enter with the blood for all the people and the Day of Atonement was like, you know, a, a yearly event, and it was a summary, a summarizing of all that had happened through the year. So they would offer sacrifices continually for their sins. The other priests could do that throughout the year. On the Day of Atonement, they would do it one more time, all together as one, one sacrifice for the for the sins of that year. And the high priest was the only one that could offer that blood sacrifice. And God would accept that and receive that. And of course, all this was symbolic. I mean, the blood sacrifices were symbolic of Jesus shedding his blood on the cross for our sins. The high priest was symbolic of Christ Jesus coming and not only offering sacrifice, but offering the main sacrifice. In his case, when Jesus went to the cross, of course, he only did it, only had to do it once, right? Which we'll look at more in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. One time, not once a year, but one time. And of course, the Day of Atonement symbolized that one time that Jesus offered his own blood. He was the sacrifice and he was the high priest. You know, the one that could do that, could offer that special sacrifice. And so that's the symbolism that we're looking at here. So we have a high priest or a chief priest or one who intercedes who offers that which covers all sin, just like on the Day of Atonement, all the sins for that year were covered again. And even better, of course, under the New Covenant, Jesus Christ, when he offered himself, like I said, all sin for all time was covered in that one sacrifice. And so we have 
an intercessor. We have someone who's gone ahead in our behalf. Jesus Christ is our high priest and our intercessor, our advocate, and all of that. And the sacrifice as well that makes it possible for us to receive forgiveness and atonement and all that. So we have a great high priest, the great high priest, and he's passed through the heavens, through the first and second, and Paul speaks of the third heaven where God dwells. So, and that's Jesus, the Son of God. So therefore, because that's true, we can take an encouragement. You know, you're not alone. That's what he's saying. We're not alone to battle against sin. We're not alone to battle. And even when we mess up, is really what he's saying. Even when we make a mistake, when we fall into unbelief, we mess up even, you know, really badly. And that happens sometimes. We can take heart and encouragement because we have someone on our side. We have a great high priest who is there at the right hand of God right now. And so since we know that's true, you know, and not only is that really important when we mess up, but it's also important when we have it just to keep us motivated, you know, just to keep us encouraged to keep going. You know, we can keep going. We don't have to give up no matter what happens in our life. We can maintain our faith, maintain our belief, maintain our commitment because someone's on our side. Jesus Christ is there for us. You know, he has us covered and he gives us the strength that we need the power that we need you know he's gone on before us and then he says in verse 15 that i that i read and start to it's, it's it's a negative sentence as i mentioned before but it's really comes out as a positive so there's a reason he puts it this way he says this is just so you know this is not, this is not what we have I want you to know that that it's not a situation where we don't have what we need. We do not have a high priest who is not able to sympathize with our weaknesses. It's not a case where some God that we are trying to please in the heavens has no idea of what it's like to be a human being and has no idea of what we're dealing with, who has no sympathy or compassion for us. That's not what we have. So he puts that to rest. This is not what we have. We do not have a high priest. This is not what he's like. It's just the opposite, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. That is not true. But was in all points, all the major points of temptation, tempted as we are, yet without sin. He does understand. Jesus does. Our high priest, our intercessor, the one who's interceding on our behalf, he is aware of what we're going through. He does understand our humanity because he was one of us. He was a human being. And so we need to understand this too. Jesus in his humanity, not in his deity, of course, he never stopped being God. And we just have to accept this by faith. How could he be God and man at the same time? Well, we just have to accept that by faith, right? It was a miracle of God that made it possible for Jesus to be born of the Virgin Mary as, he, as she was moved on by the Holy Spirit and conceived. And Jesus, you know, was placed in her womb in that form of humanity and was born, you know, and was, in fact, a human being. And some might believe that, well, because he was also God, that he could not be tempted to sin, that he was perfect, he was perfect, but that there was no possibility of, of temptation. But that's not true. Yes, it's true in his deity he couldn't be tempted, but in his humanity he could be tempted. That part of him could be tempted. In fact, it states it here. He was tempted 
as we are yet without sin and then to add to that to you know support that even as you recall in the early you know early on as jesus began his ministries he was beginning the process of going into ministry as he was on the threshold of, of beginning his earthly ministry he was driven by the holy spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights just non-stop continuously and we're not given insight into all that but then at the end of that you know the the final round of temptation you know we were given an insight into that where he was tempted to turn the stones into bread because he was so hungry and he was tempted to throw himself off of the one of the pinnacles of the temple to demonstrate you know that he was the son of god that god was with him and and all that and he was tempted then finally to bow down to satan and you know give his allegiance to him so that he could take a shortcut because satan said i will give you you know all the kingdoms of the earth you can be lord over all the kingdoms of the earth and not have to go through all the other stuff but he he passed all those tests he was tempted and what i want you to see there is if he could not be tempted then that was point that was a pointless exercise satan would not have tempted him 40 days and 40 nights and then concluded with that final round of temptation if it wasn't possible for him to give in in his humanity it was possible but he went through all that without sin and so he does understand probably much more than we realize he understands what temptation is he understands what it's like and so we can take comfort in that he knows what it's like so even if we should mess up he understands how that can happen and he has compassion for us and he's on the throne he's there to help us to aid us to give us assistance I wonder if you have a comment or a question before we move into verse 16. Anyone? No, something to say. All right. You know, these are very familiar verses, you know, that we've studied and and we've heard uh, taught and preached many, many times, right? These are some very comforting verses, very, you know, really well-known and famous passage of Scripture that's very powerful. So let's, let's get into verse 16 then, you know, you know, against the backdrop of what we just read, you know, you know, having you know, this understanding of Jesus Christ, our high priest, and what all that means for us. He says, Let us therefore, based on all that, come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't have to hesitate at all. Because there's someone there, someone waiting there for Jesus is there. Isn't it? And he's paid the debt, and he is compassionate and understanding. And so, in time of we, you know, when we've messed up, or if we just haven't messed up, haven't sinned, but you know, we're going through struggles and difficulties and whatever afflictions, you know, be it physical or mental or emotional or spiritual. He's there for us. And so we we don't have to hesitate at all as though there might be the possibility that we won't be received well or 
accepted, you know, to come before God because seeing what that Jesus has gone ahead of us and that he understands everything and and has paid the price for everything and brought us into the family of God, the position we have now as children of God, we can come boldly, you know, without hesitancy. Could just march right in to the throne of grace because we should have confidence about that, total confidence, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Two things. So if we need mercy because we've messed up, and then grace is there, which is all sufficient for that type of need and also for other needs that we have, whatever they may be. There's mercy for us and there's grace for us to help us in time of need. And unfortunately, it's our nature a lot of times, and it's you know, it really is sad and unfortunate that as human beings, we when we need God the most, sometimes we fail to do what we need to do, which is come before him with boldness and receive the help that we need. We get overwhelmed. And so whatever it is, if we've if we sinned and we hesitate to come to God sometimes, or if that's not the case, we, we just have needs in our life and we're dealing and we're struggling. When we struggle with things, when we feel overwhelmed, we often pull back from people and from God, even. We just withdraw within, within ourselves. And that's the worst thing we can do is to withdraw from God and give up. And, and you know, in our minds and hearts, we're thinking, what's the use? What's the point? That's when we need to... That's when we need to come to God the most because there's, there is help for us in time of need. There's always help for us in time of need. But we need to come. We need to come and present ourselves. I mean, God sometimes, just like parents do, like here on the earth, sometimes God will just give us good things just because, without us even asking. He just blesses us. We don't even have to ask him. But then... There's also those situations where we we need to ask him. You know, he has set it up that way where we need to come and talk to him and say, Lord, you know, I just, you already know all this, but I'm, I want to share this with you one-on-one -on -one and, and, and ask for your help and express my faith in you. And there's help there for us, always. It's help for us in time of need. Okay, anybody has something you want to share? Come on now, you guys, you could teach this lesson yourself. I, I know you've got thoughts you could share. All right. No one has anything to share. So that brings us to chapter five. And the thought continues, and he's still on the uh, concept, the image of a, of a high, high priest. Of course, you know, we understand we're no longer under the old covenant where there are earthly high priests interceding for the people because Jesus has fulfilled that in the and the new covenant fulfills the old covenant in every way. But Jesus, quite literally, under the new covenant, is our high priest. But then he goes back and explains about under the old covenant how it was for high priests, and then he goes back to you know, Jesus Christ and how he represents us. And so he's, he puts it this way, for every high priest, talking about those under the old covenant, taken from among men, taken from among men. So those who were selected 
who were of the tribe of Levi and, of course, descendants of Aaron, is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, which they did both. So that person, you know, it says he can have compassion on those who are ignorant in going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness. So those high priests under the Old Covenant, they understood weakness, they understood temptation, they understood how, as human beings, we're not perfect. And so the point he's making, so they could effectively represent the people and what they were doing because they understood, because they were human beings also. He goes on to say, Verse 2, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness because, he goes on verse 3, because of this he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifice, say, sacrifices for sins. And so since, and I mentioned this, the high priest on the Day of Atonement before he would offer the blood sacrifice for the people in total, had to offer sacrifice for himself and his family to start things off. And then he would return with the blood sacrifice for the whole nation. And since he was a human being and subject to temptations and so forth, he understood those that he was representing. And it doesn't say so here, but you know, he's still he's the the inference is that Jesus Christ, since he was one of us, right? And was tempted in everything like we are, understands again, understands what it's like to go through all these things. And then he points this out in verse four, and no man takes this honor to himself. But he was called by God just as Aaron was. So the high priest, they couldn't just decide that they were going to be a high priest, right? It was very specific, as I mentioned. They had to be from the tribe of Levi, and they had to be a descendant of Aaron, and they had to be appointed. You know, that was a requirement for them. They had certain requirements and you know Aaron was the first one that God chose for that and so then he goes on and makes the case you know those on the earth those under the old covenant had certain specifications and they didn't just choose for themselves God called them you know that later changed under the in the New Testament time when Jesus is being examined you know the high priest Caiaphas he was not of the right tribe and so forth and you know they'd reach a point where the romans could just appoint who they wanted and you know and there were even actually at that time annas and caiaphas which was annas the son-in-law were, were both high priests at the same time you know which was unheard of you know that's but that wasn't the way god designed it in the old Testament under that original covenant, they had to be, they had to fit certain requirements that are mentioned. You know, it was God ordained that. So verse 5 makes this case. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. God chose that he would be that, that Jesus would come, become a man and live among us and live the perfect life and go to the cross and that he would be God's choice to be and God himself you know appointed him to become high priest in this under this new covenant and remains that today but it, it was he who said to him and God the father said to him 
and we've covered this before previously where you know god makes this declaration in psalm chapter 2 says you are my son today I have begotten you. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And you know that is a reference to Jesus as the only begotten of the Father in the sense, you know, he was eternally the son of God. But he was the only one among humanity that, you know, that was who was God who became man. He was the only one born of the virgin. He's the only one that God sent to the earth to become humanity. And in that sense, he is the only begotten of God in that way. Born not only of humanity, but of God, because the Holy Spirit moved on the Virgin Mary and he was conceived. So he was both, and he described himself this way, both son of God and son of man. And so this is God's chosen. This is God selected. This is the only begotten of the Father. And then it goes on, he goes on to say, as he also, God also, the Father, also says in another place that we've commissioned, and that is, in uh, chapter ten I believe it is I, I can pull it up for you where he says you are a priest forever this is God speaking you are a priest forever according to the order of Mel and we'll look at that let me pull up the scripture and then we'll talk about that for a moment and we're just about to from the conclusion, because like, that brings us to a whole other line of thought, which we can save for next time. But I'll just show you this. Um, let me reference this first of all. Psalm 110, verse 4, that I just quoted. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. And that's a reference to Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. Speaking of this Melchizedek who appeared to, to Abraham, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And we'll get into more of that next time. Who was he? And the point that is being made is God selected Jesus to be a high priest, the high priest for the new covenant. And God required that he would be unique. He didn't come from the tribe of Levi and from the tribe of Judah, the praisers, as and he didn't come as a descendant of Aaron because that was the requirement for those under the old covenant. And this is the new covenant, and so, but there again, there was a unique requirement not just anybody could be the high priest. Of this new covenant, right? Representing us, going, you know, dying on the cross, being our savior, and all that. No, only only the one that God appointed. And he was from a different order outside of Levi and outside of all that. He was described here as a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was unique. We'll talk more about him next time. He wasn't from the regular priesthood or any of that, but he was chosen of God to be a high priest. 
And so that made him unique. And we'll talk about, you know, there's no record of how he, of his ancestry, no record of his descendants or any of that. So his priesthood is timeless in that sense. And uh, that's the way Jesus Christ is. And that's, that was a qualification, you know, that God established, you know, not just anybody could be, but someone that God selected and fulfilled the requirements that he uh, had established. So we're going to leave it there for tonight. Anybody have a question or a comment at the moment? What you want to add to our discussion? All right. I do thank you for uh, sharing tonight. You never know how many we're going to have on. So uh, maybe next week we'll have a few more, hopefully. And uh, that'll be great. But it was good to see all of you and uh, share with you. And, you know, may God bless you the remainder of this week. And hopefully the ladies will have a great study tomorrow night and have more than, than we've had tonight. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you later.